As a kid, I've always loved information that I could get from data and the stories that could be told with numbers. I remember growing up, I'd be frustrated at how my own parents would lie to me using numbers. You know, Talithi, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. No, no, Dad, you've only told me 17 times, and twice it wasn't my fault. I think that's one of the reasons I got a PhD in statistics. You know, I always wanted to know, what are people trying to hide with numbers? You know, as a statistician, I want people to show me the data so I can decide for myself. Donald and I were pregnant with our third child, and we were at about 41 and a half weeks, what some of you may refer to as being overdue. Statisticians, we call that being within the 95% confidence interval. And at this point in the process, we had to come in every couple of days to do a stress test on the baby. And this is just routine. It tests whether or not the baby's feeling any type of undue stress. And you're rarely, if ever, seen by your actual doctor, just whoever happens to be working at the hospital that day. So we go in for a stress test, and after 20 minutes, the doctor comes out, and he says, your baby's under stress. We need to induce you. Now, as a statistician, what's my response? Show me the data. So then he proceeds to tell us the baby's heart rate trace, where for 18 minutes the baby's heart rate was in the normal zone, and for two minutes it was in what appeared to be my heart rate zone. <laughs> and I said, well, is it possible that maybe this was my heart rate? You know, I was moving around a little bit. It's hard to lay still on your back. 41 weeks pregnant for 20 minutes. You know, maybe it was shifting around. He said, well, we don't want to take any chances. I said, okay. I said, what if I was at 36 weeks with this same data? Would your decision be to induce? Well, well no, no, I would wait until you were at least 38 weeks, but you're almost 42. There's no reason to leave that baby inside. Let's get you a room. I said, well, you know, I... <laughs> Why don't we just do it again? You know, we could collect more data. I could, I could try to be really still for 20 minutes. We could sort of average the two and see, you know, <laughs> what that means. And he goes, well, ma'am, I just don't want you to have a miscarriage. <laughs> well, <laughs> That makes three of us. <laughs> and then he says, you know, your chances of having a miscarriage double when you go past your due date. Let's get you a room. Wow. So now as a statistician, what's my response? Show me the data. Dude, you're talking chances. I do chances all day long. Tell me all about chances. <laughs> Let's talk chances. Let's talk chances. So I say, okay, great. So, so like, do I go from like a 30% chance to a 60% chance? Like, where are we here with this miscarriage? Like, and he goes, well, n n not quite, but it doubles. And we really just want what's best for the baby. <laughs> Undaunted, I try a different angle. I said, okay, out of 1,000 full-term pregnant women, how many of them are going to miscarry just before their due date? And then he looks at me and looks at Donald and he goes, about one in a thousand. I said, okay, okay, and so of those thousand women, how many are gonna miscarry just after their due date? About two. <laughs> I said, okay, so you're telling me that my chances go from a 0.1% chance <laughs> to a 0.2% chance. Okay, so at this point, the data is not convincing us that we need to be induced. And so then we proceed to have a conversation about how inductions lead to a higher rate of cesarean section, and if at all possible, we'd like to avoid that. And then I said, you know, and I really don't think my due date is accurate. <laughs> and so this really stunned him, <laughs> and he looked sort of puzzled. And I said, well, you, you may not know this, but pregnancy due dates are calculated assuming that you have a standard 28-day cycle, and, and my cycle ranges. Sometimes it's 27, sometimes it's up to 38, and I had been collecting the data to prove it. <laughs> and so 
we ended up leaving the hospital that day without being induced. We actually had to sign a waiver to walk out of the hospital. And, and now I'm not advocating that you not listen to your doctors, okay? Because even with, with our first child, we were induced at 38 weeks, cervical fluid was low, right? I'm not anti-medical intervention. But why were we confident to leave that day? Well, we had data that told a different story, right? We had been collecting data for six years. I had this temperature data and it told a different story. In fact, we could probably pretty accurately estimate conception. Yeah, that's a story you want to tell at your kid's wedding <laughs> reception. I remember it like it was yesterday. My temperature was a sizzling 97.8 degrees as I stared into your father's eyes. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. 22 more years we're telling that story. But we were confident to leave because we had been collecting data. Now, what does that data look like? Here's a standard chart of a woman's waking body temperature during the course of a cycle. So from the beginning of a menstrual cycle to the beginning of the next. You'll see that the temperature is not random, right? There clearly, there's a low pattern at the beginning of her cycle. And then you see this jump and then a higher set of temperatures at the end of her cycle. So what's happening here? What is that data telling you? Well, ladies, at the beginning of our cycle, the hormone estrogen is dominant, and that estrogen causes a suppression of your body temperature. And at ovulation, your body releases an egg, and progesterone takes over. Progestation. Okay? And so your body heats up in anticipation of housing this new little fertilized egg. So why this temperature jump? Well, think about when a bird sits on her eggs, right? Why is she sitting on them? She wants to keep them warm, right? Protect them and keep them warm. Ladies, this is exactly what our bodies do every month. They heat up in anticipation of keeping a new little life warm. And if nothing happens, if you're not pregnant, then estrogen takes back over and that cycle starts all over again. But if you do get pregnant, sometimes you actually see another shift in your temperatures and it stays elevated for those whole nine months. That's why you see those pregnant women just sweating and hot, right? Because their temperatures are high. Here's a chart that we had about three or four years ago. We were really very excited about this chart. You'll see the low temperature level and then a shift. And for about five days, that's about the time it takes for the egg to travel down your fallopian tube and implant. And then you see those temperatures start to go up a little bit. And in fact, we had a second temperature shift confirmed with a pregnancy test that we were indeed pregnant with our first child. Very exciting. Until a couple of days later, I saw some spotting and then I noticed heavy blood flow. And we had in fact had an early stage miscarriage. And what appeared, had I not been taking my temperature, I really just thought my period was late that month. But we actually had data to show that we had miscarried this baby. And even though this data revealed a really unfortunate event in our lives, it was information that we could then take to our doctor, right? So if there was a fertility issue or some problem, I had data to show like, look, we got pregnant, our temperature shifted, we somehow lost this baby. What is it that we can do to help prevent this problem? And it's not just about temperatures, and it's not just about fertility, you know, we can use data about our bodies to tell us a lot of things. For instance, did you know that taking your temperature can tell you a lot about the condition of your thyroid? So your thyroid works a lot like the thermostat in your house, right? There's an optimal temperature that you want in your house. You set your thermostat. When it gets too cold in the house, your thermostat kicks in and says, hey, we need to blow some heat around. Or if it gets too hot, your thermostat sort of registers, turn the AC on, cool us off. That's exactly how your thyroid works in your body. Right? Your thyroid tries to keep an optimal temperature for your body. If it gets too cold, your thyroid says, hey, we need to heat up. If it gets too hot, your thyroid cools you down. But what happens when your thyroid is not functioning well? Well, when it doesn't function, then it shows up in your body temperatures. They tend to be lower than normal or very erratic. And so by collecting this data, you can find out information about your thyroid. Now, 
What is it if you had a thyroid problem and you went to the doctor, your doctor would actually test the amount of thyroid stimulating hormone in your blood? Fine. But the problem with that test, it doesn't tell you how active the hormone is in your body. So you might have a lot of hormone present, but it might not be actively working to regulate your body temperature. So just by collecting your temperature every day, you get information about the condition of your thyroid. So what if you don't want to take your temperature every day? I advocate that you do, but there are tons of other things you could take. You could take your blood pressure, you could take your weight. Yeah, who's excited about taking their weight every day? <laughs> Early on in our marriage, uh, Donald had a stuffy nose, and um, he had been taking a slew of medications to try to relieve his stuffy nose to no avail. And so that night he comes and he wakes me up, and he says, honey, I can't breathe out of my nose. And, and I sort of roll over and I look and I said, well, well can you breathe out of your mouth? <laughs> and, and he goes, yes, but I can't breathe out of my nose. And so like any good wife, I rush him to the emergency room at two o'clock in the morning. And the whole time I'm driving and I'm thinking, you can't die on me now. We just got married. People will think I killed you. <laughs> and so we get to the emergency room and, and the nurse sees us and, and, you know, he can't breathe out of his nose. And, and so she brings us to the back and, and the doctor says, what seems to be the problem? And he goes, I can't breathe out of my nose. And he says, you can't breathe out of your nose? And I'm like, no, but he could breathe out of his mouth. <laughs> okay. So he sort of takes a step back and he looks at both of us and he says, sir, I, I, I think I know the problem. You're having a heart attack. I'm going to order an EKG and a CAT scan for you immediately. And we're thinking, no, 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 it's, it's not a heart attack. He can breathe just out of his mouth. Like, it, no, 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 no. And so we go back and forth with, with this doctor because we think this is the incorrect diagnosis. And, and, and he's like, no, really, it'll be fine. And, you know, just, just calm down. And I'm thinking, how do you calm down? I don't think it's having a heart attack. And so fortunately for us, this doctor was at the end of his shift. And so this new doctor comes in. He, he sees us clearly distraught with a husband who can't breathe out of his nose. <laughs> and he starts asking us questions. He says, well, do you two exercise? I'm like, well, we ride our bikes and we go to the gym occasionally. <laughs> we move around. Um, he says, well, what, what were you doing just before you came here? And I'm thinking, well, I was sleeping, honestly. <laughs> but okay, what was Donald doing just before he was taken? So Donald goes into this slew of medications he was taking, and he lists, he, I took this decongestion, and then I took this nasal spray, and then all of a sudden a light bulb goes off, and he says, oh, you should never mix this decongestion with this nasal spray. Clogs you up every time. Here, take this one instead. Gives us a prescription. And so we're looking at each other, and I look at the doctor, and I say, well, well, why is it that it seems like you were able to accurately diagnose his condition, but this previous doctor wanted to order an EKG and a CAT scan? And he looks at us and he says, well, when a 350-pound man walks in the emergency room and says he can't breathe, you assume he's having a heart attack, and you ask questions later. Now, emergency room doctors are trained to make decisions quickly, but not always accurately. And so had we had some information about our heart health to share with him, maybe we would have gotten a better diagnosis the first time. I want you to consider the following chart of systolic blood pressure measurements from October of 2010 to July of 2012. You'll see that these measurements start in the pre-hypertension, hypertension zone, but over about the course of a year and a half, they move into the normal zone. This is about the heart rate of a healthy 16-year-old. What story is this data telling you? Okay. Obviously, it's the data from someone who's made a drastic transformation. And fortunately for us, that person happens to be here today. So that 350-pound guy that walked into the emergency room with me is now an even sexier and healthier 225-pound guy. And that's his blood pressure trace. So over the course of that year and a half, 
Donald's eating changed and her, our exercise regimen changed and his heart rate responded, right? His blood pressure responded to that change that he made in his body. So what's the take home message that I want you to leave with today? By taking ownership of your data, just like we've done, right? just by taking these daily measurements about yourself, you become the expert on your body. You become the authority. It's not hard to do. You don't have to have a PhD in statistics to be an expert in yourself. You don't have to have a medical degree to be your body's expert. And medical doctors, they're experts on the population, but you are the expert on yourself. And so when two of you come together, when two experts come together, the two of you are able to make a better decision than just your doctor alone. Right? So now that you understand the power of information that you can get through personal data collection, I'd like you all to stand and raise your right hand. <laughs> yes, get it up. I challenge you to take ownership of your data. And today, I hereby confer upon you a TEDx associate's degree in elementary statistics <laughs> with a concentration in time-dependent data analysis with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. And so the next time you are in your doctor's office as newly inducted statisticians, what should always be your response? I can't hear you. One more time. Show me the data. Show me the data. Thank you.